Hey Shane, it's great to have you here on The Void. What have you been up to lately? I've been in one project for about five years. I've been in, we've been working on with a guy who produces our records. It's got to, it's kind of like doomy-ish, I don't know, doomy, weird, shoe, shoegazing, doomy kind of music. But Billy from Faith No More plays bass on some of the tracks. Troy from Mastodon, guy from Voivod. I'm getting guitar, so we put all together, because the guy who produces our albums, he's part of it, so we did it we record for free. So we've just been like zoning out on it forever. It's called Tronos. Tronos. Which is just Spanish for uh, th um, Thrones. Thrones. I nicked it from a Game of Thrones DVD in Spain, <laughs> Spanish. Well, it's a solid name. So is this something that hasn't really been birthed out to the world yet? No. Russ Russell, the guy who produces the Napalm albums and stuff, and all the stuff I've been involved with, He's, uh, he's got quite he's quite a bit of a graphic dude as well. He does that he does this kind of I don't know what you call that. Would it be cubism? I'm not sure, but lots of Escher type type kind of stuff. So he's got lots of visual stuff going on and I, and I, if we if we can pull it off, I'd like to be able to play the Roadburn Festival in Holland. Oh, sure. Because then you'd be able to do the projections, you know. And because of the people involved, I can only ever imagine doing the odd show here and there. Yeah. Which is fine. So what are you listening to right now? I like the new Mastodon albums, mind blowing. Do you even know those guys well? I'm friends with those, yeah. I mean, Kevin probably didn't mention that me and him are doing a project with Bill and Brian from Mastodon. Okay, tell me about it. Well, we've just got about three million riffs now. He's got to try and arrange it into songs. It's heavy stuff. We demoed it at Bill's studio where, because Kevin built Bill's studio for him. Oh, Kevin's, Kevin's a grind called Carpenter, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, that's what, so we just got a bunch of riffs there. It's a case of trying to work out how we arrange the songs. It's going to take a while. What's happening with Napalm Death? I started recording some new stuff. Uh, about five, four or five weeks ago, quite a lot of songs. Um, hopefully, carry that. Well, we will be. We're carrying that on in the new year. It's gonna take a while to get finished, but um, yeah, it's fast. But there's also a lot of weird, a lot of uh, there's some. Hopefully, some. I don't say, I won't say experimental, but hopefully it, when it's, once it's done, it'll go in a few different directions, you like know? Like noise kind of shit? I don't say noise, yeah. but I mean, there might be, yeah, there'll be some stuff like that, but there's like uh, some sort of, a couple of mid price kind of Killing Joke-esque influences. and Sick. The last Killing Joke is amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliant, it's brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Um, yeah, so hopefully we veer off in a few directions, you know, and hopefully, um, you know, it'll make the album a bit, uh, it'll still be, abrasive but not constantly fast all the time there is some extremely fast stuff but you know yeah we've all been we've all been kind of like ticking away every album trying a little bit of this a little bit of that so each step so hopefully you know this one will be a, the most diverse one yet i hope that's interesting I, hope. Well, I guess you'd have to keep it in like you guys have been at it for a while well on the last i mean on the last album we started with a really strange slow swans influence track and not everyone liked it you know well, I think actually most people did like it, but the record label was like, oh, you know, you can't start an album with four minutes of this. And I'm like, well, they don't like it. They just play Skip, won't they? <laughs> and nowadays, most of the bloody kids like Spotify, so they're rear why because why bother being precious? Because they'll just change the track listing if they feel like it anyway, so it won't matter. It's true. If you can't stop doing record, you, you know, it's like, oh, well, I'm because oh, our, our A&R guy doesn't like it, I'm not going to start my album with this track. Well, that's kind of the wrong reason, isn't it? You know? Do you think a sort of like a fuck everything attitude of defiance is sort of its central element to Napalm Death and maybe like grindcore as a, as a musical movement? I think so. I mean, it's also part of your personality, probably a little bit as well. I mean, you know, it's uh, when, I, when I was tape trading, before the joined Napalm and then all of us sort of formed the bands that we did or whatever. Um, you liked the fact that you were into stuff that people didn't particularly get, you know? All my metal buddies, I mean, I come from a heavy metal, rock heavy metal background, but I wasn't going to go you know, further and further and not all of my friends did. So I'd get a kick out of the fact they didn't understand it. It was, that was, you know, that was funny to me because I, Although, why don't you understand it, you know? I think it's a good filter because I think you've got to be sort of a, you know, like a thinker and someone open to different stuff. Like, extreme music sort of attracts a certain kind of person, I reckon. I think there's a certain personality. I mean, it's like, I've been talking to, I mean, Kevin Sharp or Buzz from Melvin's, a few people. They, Buzz always says he's like an anthropologist in music and it's like, no, I like that term because you are, you know, you get into, obviously you'll start off in one genre, but if you if you're open, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna tiptoe through everything else, aren't you? Do you have any fond memories of the Australian band Blood Duster? Well, I mean, I've known them for a long, long time. The first time I actually met them was in Tokyo. Did Jason Fuller of Blood Duster once throw piss on you? 
Not me, no. I wanted my, I wanted my friends. I thought, which I thought was funny. He actually thought, told me he he thought it was on you. It might have had a dribble on me, but I'm not gonna get. I'm not, I mean, I'm not gonna get worried about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've done that on myself at regular <laughs> intervals, so so why would I worry about that? You know. But um, yeah, I think he was naked at the time. Yeah, he does do that a lot. Less so now. I think guys have filmed their last, the second last show, and they weren't naked. Less well, so that's fun. Days. I mean, there's, what's wrong with that? No, it's fine. You know, they should be you naked. just table up the good bits so you don't don't get chafed when you're playing. And you're all right. Have you guys ever played naked? <laughs> at an Austrian festival, I did run around completely naked for a whole day. Myself, Nicholas Barker, my friend Frank Healy from A Ben Ben Addiction, and Simon Effamy is doing sound. It was his fault. <laughs> what prompted this? Lots of tight tequila, because the festival had alcohol-free beer, so we were drinking it. We, we started in Birmingham. It's was bomb death. Going away for two shows. And we went to that pub. All our friends came along. No, they said, so you get your passport, we're going off to Europe for the weekend. So we, went, we, we, we they all turned up, we went. Bus broke down, we ended up in France. We eventually went to the, got to the show in, in Austria, already mashed. Simon started, Simon has a, so much, Simon has sound engineer is notorious for getting naked. So he started it. <laughs> <coughs> and me and him just ran around in a, in, a, in a pool in France for a while. And then the next day, it just kicked off. It just like, the, 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 the beer wasn't working. And so uh, Nick went and bought three bottles of tequila. And then we spent the entire day, as far as I recollect, naked. Broad daylight. Did it make the day more interesting? It was great. Yeah. It's very liber liberating. Many other things happened. Uh, listening to Judas Priest naked in the back of the bus, head banging. Is that, and it's another Birmingham band. Yeah, I mean, it's quite bonding when you're naked men together, I find. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, what do you, especially listening to Judas Priest. It was great. It was, it was amazing. We put our clothes. It was quite funny because we were on the tour bus and we put our clothes on to go to bed. <laughs> Then my mate woke up at three or four in the morning, totally late to the party, he got naked and started playing Apex Twins Come to Daddy, which was a bit surreal when you go to the toilet. But anyway, there's many more aspects that I could tell you about, but anyway, no, I thought, I, th I, thought, I thought, you know, I thought it was kind of funny when Jason threw the, the urine into the, into the crowd and, uh, you know, speaking honestly, some grand cool bands are too friggin' serious, and they are. I'm not like that, you know, me personally. It's like, yeah, you, the world is this shitty place. It's always been this shitty place, and, and Being a bummer is you know, and it's like, well, you know, lyrically, don't get me wrong. I mean, this sounds strange. You know, you talk about things that are passionate, and that's cool. But it's also nice to have a laugh, you know. And I like that, you know. A lot of people have said you guys invented grime, but who do you think sort of came before you? Like, what made it for you? Well, I mean, Napalm Death was a a band that when they first started were not very grindcore at all. You know, in the 80, 81, 82, 83 period, they were. More anarcho punk. You're Well, they were early Napalm Death, yeah, and it was early in '86 when it uh, started to go really, really fast. And that was uh, due to bands like Siege and the Boston hardcore scene. Yeah. And they're also mixing up with uh, stuff like Celtic Frost from Switzerland, you know. What are the bands that mattered to you? Like, you were a drummer, right? A drum, drum originally in Unseen Terror. Yeah. Well, multitudes of bands, but I mean, when it comes to tape trading or the stuff, the extreme stuff, it would be Repulsion, you know, things like that, Terrorizer. And they were all kind of happening at the same time as Napalm, you know. So I met the Napalm guys, became friends with them and joined them. Um, they're all kind of existing at the same time. I think in each country, there's, I mean, it would be fair to say in a lot of countries around the world, each had their own band, mm. you know, going, had, yeah, yeah. Yeah, going for it. Uh, Napalm kind of sort of nipped in there first in some ways, probably, you know. And because of Napalm, the way we were, we'd always pay homage to the, the bands that we loved and we'd always mention them. I mean, Matt from Exhumed always said to me that he kind of liked the idea that we were never afraid to go, well, you know, Repulsion from here or Terrorizer from there or Blood Dust from Australia, whatever, any band, you know, because we, we liked what we liked and we'd tell people about it because our thing was spreading the word. So, 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 some bands are very uptight about it, you know. You know, they're like, oh, They've got they, they know they they know where they're nicking a little bit of this from, but they're not they're not going to tell anybody you know if it is where we go. Well, you know, well we have nicked a couple of riffs from in tune, you know, whatever. You know, we'll just say it, and what, who cares, you know? You know, I mean, Napalm did the A side of Scum before they did before they before it became a proper album. So I just sent it to everybody around the world, along with the drummer and a few other people did as well. So we we're in part responsible, I think, a little bit for Napalm reaching out and in turn those bands who loved it reached out to us and so we got terrorizer demos or whoever you know at any point i'd be getting records from japan and stuff from 
say the America or tapes from New York and you know the, these bands were like obviously they were like in their garages and just doing their own thing and there wasn't it's not like now you know they were like coming up I mean I'm saying not saying bands don't come up with their own ideas but there's like blueprints around <laughs> and there's a lot of blueprints around there's a lot of like well you know if you want to learn how to blast you go and check this video out and they'll show you but back then you didn't have that you had to work that out yourself you had to listen to, I mean I used to listen to Repulsion's rehearsal tape I mean the blast beats typically a, a one foot thing but I used to kind of cheat as Jeff Walker would say like that, you know because I thought Repulsion did it, I listened to the rehearsal tape because I'm sure that one bass drum is like differently tuned to the other, so he must be using two bass drums. He wasn't, but I thought he was. So that's what made me think of playing that. But now you go, oh, I go on YouTube and so-and-so, has got, oh, this is the technique you do. You know, none of that existed back then. Do you think it's more creatively stimulating to be, like, isolated? And I don't always think about it. It's just it's interesting that some, ex, ex, some in, in regards to extreme bands, they do sometimes tend to come from really small villages. I mean, my first band was like a, I don't know, black de death metal kind of whatever band. And it was, it was the village I come from is like 2,000 people, you know, with only four people in there. And through that band, I met, Bill, you know, I met Bill Steer, who became guitarist in Napalm and Carcass. He came to our show, you know, like Borovoy, who was Blabbermouth and Monty Cotton. Yeah, you know, he, he was a big Warhammer fan, which is the band, you know. Lee Dorn's going to release it soon. They did this 33-year-old demo, which sounds like shit, you know. Um, and all these, but you know, there was a lot of these bands around the world from very small, you know. Emma Nicky, who, played, who dropped, used to be the old drummer from Entombed, he wrote to me when we did on Seeing Terrace. All these people back then have gone on to do all these other things, you know. Especially in Scandinavia, because you'll meet like these kind of like sort of normal rock type dudes and they used to be in like crazy death metal bands tape trading back in the day and then you forget the names and they'll just you know, out of the blue they'll just go yeah I wrote to you in 87 you fucking idiot you didn't write back to me or something you know and you're like oh right really shit right. Jesse who passed away now unfortunately from terrorizer he brought some old letters over that I wrote to him I was like good man that was pretty nice back when I was 19 and 20 hey come I can't write like that name you know because you just don't do it you know you don't do it I mean as regards getting compliments you know we all sort of like complimented each other when we were tape trading, you know? But I say from a, a fame, famous person, you know, that'd be like Ronnie James Deer was the best compliment I had because I, I grew up young in, in heavy metal, you know, and he, I met him, Simon, who does our sound, he was doing the same for a band called Iced Earth and when Dio was singing with Evan and Hell. Finally met him, I knew he was an A-Bomb fan, you know? I didn't know that. Yeah, he's an A-Bomb fan. And, um, and he was just, he just, you know, he was there with his glass of wine you know, we were talking about Birmingham and Spark Hill and when they worked on the Heaven and Hell album and he, we were talking about curry houses. And he was telling you, he, you know, his memory was very good. He's so, sharp as a tack, man. I saw him when he was 70. He's fucking going to blow anyone away. So, you know, and he was saying, well, you know, I really like Nabom. He goes, well, I did here. And he said, oh, yeah, amazing. You know, and he put his hand on your my shoulder and he goes, don't ever give up, you know. You know, and I was like, and I'd had a few beers because it was right before my birthday. And it was like being touched by that. And I had to sit down, I had a kind of, and I started having a, a tear came in my eye because it was like, you know, was, this is like the, the almighty to me, you know. Dude, I mean, it's Sabbath, come on. <laughs> well, you, I mean, everyone has their favourite, don't they? Everyone likes Ozzy, but I would prefer Dio because it's a bit more tuneful, you know. He's, yeah, you can't really fuck with those guys. And they, they used to have headbanging competitions to Rainbow Stargazer when I was about 12, <laughs> you know. But um, that's another story. <laughs> but, um, you what know. Can, yeah, what keeps Napalm Death being exciting all these years? <clears throat> well, we get on, mostly, you know. Do you and Barney have much of a, a like, a musical shorthand where you, like, know what each other's thinking? Uh, I would say that. Yeah. We're quite different. Yeah. Me and Barney are chalk and cheese, really? really, I think. In life, in all things? Possibly in, yeah, I mean, he's very outspoken political. I mean, I'm... Yeah, what's what, your whole take? Because, I mean, the I'm drive a bit has my, also been, always been a bit of a socio-political genre. But yeah, I mean, I tend to, like, not comment on any of it. But, it's, to me, it's not like a bolt-on. It's yeah. part of me as a person. Mm. So to me, it's, it's not necessarily political, even though... Well, it's, a, it's a bad word, because yeah. like, what is that to me, like? Yeah, to me, it's yeah. a human thing. Yeah. That's what it is. It's part of being a human being. It's something that I keep banging the drum about. Mm. But I think half the problem, half the reason why the world has been such a fucking mess for centuries, this is not nothing new, you know, this is going back many centuries, is because people have forgotten I think what it is to be a human being. It's a, to, to, they, they don't know what humanity is. You know, they don't understand that you don't have to treat people in really heinous ways. 
you know, and but but the problem is is that the temptation of power and control is makes people do some really heinous things, you know. And uh, I'm complete I try and completely smash that for at least for what what small amount I can do, you know. I, I mean, I'd be the same even if I wasn't in the band. That's yeah. the point. What would you be doing if you weren't playing in Napalm Death? Uh, evolutionary biology. I always wanted to study that. That's interesting. And uh, or, or a Soviet-era historian, because yeah. it's a different thing, but it's another great interest of mine. What sort of led you to the study of humanity? I, I recognise the fact that if we don't... If you don't learn from the past, you know, you will never, you will keep making the same mistakes, you and know. In some case worse. And I, I, I think people sometimes treat certainly each other and the environment, of course, they treat it like it can be, they can sort of um, kick it around and, and kill it and think that it's going to come back to life, you know, but, but of course that's not the case. I, I think with Napalm Death, you know, especially, yeah. especially when you're coming into a band that's you know, to the fact that there's not an original member in the band anymore. Yeah. So they have to, you have to, that's always a... Well, that's a good point. But you, you guys know, are the longest running. But yeah, of course, of course. But I mean, I, you know, I've been there that's since, I've yeah. been I've been there since, since almost Scum came out. Yeah. Could have, should have played and it didn't. Yeah, Big regret, you know. Okay. I, 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 I was, I, you well, well, I was offered, but I didn't. Yeah. But, it's okay, know. life goes on. So that's, the, bit, that, that, that's, that's the only big regret <laughs> of me. Because that would have silenced all those people that had to put the phone, you're not really the original member, are you? You know. But the band sets itself up as a as a, a very a very plentiful kind of band. Mm. But I come from a metal background, whereas yeah, I have particular morals. I have my thoughts on the world, but I'm not really. One, I'm not gonna. Yeah. I'm also like, well, I'm all about the music. I'm all about making extreme music and making sounds and tone. You know, I started. I, I got into like Slade and the Sweet, Judas Priest, Sabbath, and then I got into grindcore. And then I started listening to Sonic Youth, the Pixies, and My Bloody Valentine. And so I like to bring it all together. I'm all about sound. That's my thing. Bar that, Barney, that's his thing. I don't disagree with him, mm. but he's the, that's that's his thing. Yeah. My thing is the music, you know, and the, and the sounds of the Sonics, you know. Yeah. So that's how we kind of balance, I think. Who do you think is the most extreme musician? It's a, it's an old tested thing, but I mean, obviously Michael Geyer and the early Swans, you know, yeah. would strike me as being very sort of innovative in the fact that, you know, a lot of people don't, you, you know, it's an acquired taste. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. always the most challenging when people are the acquired taste because some people just couldn't get them. Like one of my, like Mitch, who plays guitar on and St. Terry, hated Swans for years. And now he's like, I saw him the other day, he's like, Shane, I finally got the Swans. I'm like, well, that's cool. Brilliant. I finally got the Descendants, so let's shake hands. You know, you know so it, it's all right, you know. But, um, I mean, definitely Michael Guy of Swans. I mean, you know, uh, what the hell's that? We always get his damn name from the Wild Bloody Valentine. What's his name? Shields, Kevin Shields. I, I, that's interesting. I, 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 I like because his techniques are insane, you know. It's yeah. like the fact that it sounds like it's being slowed down. It's going backwards, you know. I don't do drugs anymore, but when I did, it was insane. It was good, you know. <laughs> so I like that. I like the fact that you can listen to something that makes you feel like you were, you know, on the floor, stoned out your mind in 1991. Because that, that imprints itself in your head, you know. So that that again would be would be someone you know um, Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth really people like wow, that you know yeah. you know because they just they ch they challenge stuff because they did things differently and different guitar tunings and yeah. you know I tried to that's that that was it that's been interesting to me and I've tried we try to bring that into Napalm but they do it so differently when you analyse what they do and what you think they do it's different things. You reckon? Yeah. Well, they they you know the they. Well, they're, they're all two, they're all like two string guitars, different tunings and stuff like that. And as a metal guitarist, whatever you know, you take what you hear in your head and you process it that way. But it's yeah. different to how they do it because <clears throat> you know we're doing a Sonic Youth cover on their Napalm record. We're yeah. doing we're doing White Cross. Oh really? Yeah. So we're doing White Cross, and so we had to we were we were, you know we were analysing how they do it, trying to yeah, 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 work it out, and it's very different to how what what I, how they do it and how I hear it. So. Yeah. Some of those people to me are like challenging, like you know, um, Steve Albini from Big Black, you know, Buzz Buzz Osborne from Melvins, you know, even though he's a friend of mine, I'd still I admire him a lot because he's uh, he's not afraid to do whatever the fuck he wants, and I like that. There's sort of a theme here that it's sort of a characteristic of all grindcore bands, this whole like not not giving a fuck thing. And was that something that sort of drew you to the music and the band? I think when, I think when I first joined Napalm, I mean, I, it, when I saw them, they were, they were instantly my favourite band, and I thought, well. My dad always didn't understand why I quit my job to, follow, to actually to actually follow them around because I'd, I'd hang out with Mickey and just go out 
go to the gigs with them, and that's, that's why I quit the job, not even to join the band, just to follow them around. And then I finally joined the band, and then you know, we did the Peel, John Peel set, radio sessions um, on BBC and stuff like that, and all these documentaries happened, which we couldn't have predicted. That was good because we, you know, we were a grindcore, hardcore band, but people, when people heard that John Peel were playing us, all of a sudden people at the wedding present met me the band, the wedding were liking us, and uh, people like Jesus Jones and all these strange people were getting into us. Man, what John Peel did for music and sort of breaking bands and, you know, taking a chance on bands and sort of guiding people and listening, like, whoa. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, from where he came from, you know, he was, his thing was that if, uh, if he didn't like a band at first, he thought there was something wrong with him. So he would go back and listen to it and listen to it. I actually got invited down to his house a couple of years ago to go through his record collection to pick oh, out man. to pick out my favourite, a, a journey from where I came to get into Grindcore, you know. Amazing. So that was pretty interesting to see all that stuff that he had. He had like multiple copies of like Napalm and stuff. You know, yeah, all the Blood Duster albums were there because Relapse would send everything. So there was this, the 30, this like 30,000 al albums on vinyl, 15,000 12 inches in the shed, 10,000 7 inches, then the CD rooms. You know, I mean, he'd like, you know, you'd see the kitchen, but the, 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 the ceiling had been cut through so the vinyl could go from the top to the bottom. You know, so I was picking out records that I liked. It was all labelled clearly on little cards, you know. So that was something I never imagined. But it was because of him, you know, he, he brought, he crossed Napalm over to a whole different audience. And in the 90s, we kind of went a bit, we followed the more death metal origins of the band. But as the past 10 years again, 10 years have gone on, we've managed to sort of blend it back in again. And I like the fact that, you know, we're pushing the the noise boundaries really the way it should have should always be really. Oh, you know. Yeah. What do you listen to the most right now? Uh, I'm a big fan of the new Goldfrap album. I love that Goldfrap album. I love Goldfrap in general. The first album album's amazing. It reminds me of uh, being six years old and watching uh, like James Bond movies and John Barry. Because all I think all that stuff. When you're a young kids, like my daughter's four now, and she I think. Think, I think when things that you hear from an early age, they'll they'll they're the imprints in your mind, and I I think I, if you haunt you, certain tones or certain whatever it is, what is it minor scales or whatever the hell, whatever you love as a kid, that's gonna if you if you be, if you if you like music as you get older, you become a musician. It's played then. When I got the first Gold Rap album, that just reminded me of all those sort of old John Barry, sort of early nineteen seventies British movies, you know. And my favourite band ever is still a band called Cardiacs, for those who've never ever heard of them. They have, they have multiple records, it's uh, very prog, it's like Genesis on speed, with a bit of punk, with a bit of toy dolls in there for good measures. <laughs> if you haven't heard them, you've got to check them, because if, if you like them, they'll be the only band you'll ever, ever want to listen to. So.